October will mark the 10th anniversary of a war in Afghanistan. And I think for many Americans, this is a war that uh, has been going on for so long that it has faded into background noise. And one way to uh, appreciate uh, what is happening in Afghanistan is to read Sebastian Younger's book, War, uh, which is the focus of today's talk. I, I will give brief introductions because we're a little bit late, but I think most of you know that uh, uh, Sebastian Younger is a contributing editor to Vanity Fair. He's a journalist who's covered many major stories and the best-selling author of a number of books, including The Perfect Storm, Fire, and A Death in Belmont, and of course his most recent book, War, which was published in 2010. Uh, and this book really chronic chronicles not the politics of the war, but the psychological and social um, aspects of the war that are experienced by the soldiers who are fighting it. His experience in Afghanistan is also the focus of a documentary called Restrepo, um, which was nominated for an Academy Award, um, was a grand jury prize for a domestic, do for do domestic documentary at the Sundance Film Festival in 2010, um, and is... Uh, uh, very, based very much on the book. I, I want to note one thing that I think is important is that Restrepo was co-directed with um, Sebastian Younger's good friend Tim Hetherington, who was killed recently in Libya on April 20th due to a rocket or mortar attack, um, along with a number of other journalists. One other was killed and two others were wounded. Uh, Hetherington was a Vanity Fair staff member as well, uh, a news photographer, noted videographer, documentary filmmaker, writer, and artist as well. And I expect that um, Sebastian Younger may want to say a little bit about, um, uh, about that very unfortunate um, incident. The, the way we're structuring this uh, 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 discussion this evening, because it really is a discussion, is that Michael O'Hanlon will be interviewing Sebastian Younger. And Michael is somebody who's very well known at Princeton. He received his PhD from the Woodrow Wilson School in 1991. He's the Director of Research and Senior Fellow of Foreign Policy Studies at the Brookings Institution, a senior author of Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan Index Projects, and co-author of a book called Toughing It Out in Afghanistan. And he's currently working on a new book on Obama's foreign policy. Uh, he also uh, comes and teaches at the school, something that we appreciate very much. So I'd like to turn it over to Michael, and uh, then I'll pl close this out when we're done. Thanks. Thank you, Dean Paxson, and uh, thank you especially, Sebastian, for just an amazing book. Um, I, I also wanted to make a brief comment, uh, picking up on the title of the book, Toughing It Out in Afghanistan. Um, I was at graduate school with David Petraeus in the 1980s, and when I gave him a copy of the book a year ago, he said to me, oh, Mike, nice title. I didn't realize you had toughed it out in Afghanistan. And, uh, and he had a very good point, because as those of you who have already read some of Sebastian's book will know, uh, in my trips, I'm basically a fobby. I'm basically at the big bases with you know the occasional quick helicopter trips out uh, to the smaller bases, or sometimes an occasional walk through town for an hour. Uh, Obviously, uh, it was much different for Sebastian. He lived this war uh, and in one of the most remote and difficult parts of the country. So I really wanted to thank you for explaining war in a way that uh, I think very few of us begin to appreciate, even when we have a chance to go to Afghanistan. Most of us don't begin to see and, and, and accomplish what you did. Um, thank you. Well, thank you. And, and, and I want to, um, to get in, uh, there's, it's very hard, of course, to capture uh, the emotional power of the book. I'm just going to read a, a little segment in just a moment, if you don't mind, to give people a feel for that. But before uh, I do, because that really is, I think, the body and soul of the book is, is men at war and what it's like for them, I wanted to briefly ask you just to explain a little bit about the origin of why you went to eastern Afghanistan, to the Korangal yeah. Valley, um, in 2007 and spent much of that next year in that particular part of the country, just sort of the logistics of how the, the project took shape, and then maybe uh, I'll proceed with the reading. Well, uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I first went to Afghanistan in 1996. Uh, I was there in Jalalabad and Kabul um, right before the Taliban uh, overran those cities. Uh, in fact, I got shot at by Taliban gunners on the outskirts of Kabul in the summer of 96, and uh, 
uh, while, while fighting a horrible bout of dysentery. It was a pretty miserable day. Um, but um, and then I went, you know, I went back in 2000, I was with Masood, and then 2001, I was, I was with the Northern Alliance, with his fighters, when they took Kabul um, and pushed the Taliban out with U.S. air support, obviously. And, it, you know, back, back then, 2001, 2002, it was, if you were on the ground there, it was an amazing time. I mean, the Afghans were so grateful. I mean, they were so jubilant at being liberated from the Taliban. And the Taliban were, just seemed to have been pulverized. Um, no one knew where Al-Qaeda was. And it just looked like the story was over. And, um, and the war, thank God, and the war was won. And now we just had to sort of stay there and, spo- and follow through and, and sort of try to put the country back together a bit. And um, it didn't work out that way. And by 2005, having always worked with the, lo- with the civilian population in various wars I'd been in, Sierra Leone, Liberia, in 2005, I thought, okay, my country is going to be in, in, in Afghanistan for a long time, and I need to know what it's like to be a soldier uh, in combat, uh, an American soldier in combat. So I did something I'd never done before. Um, I embedded. Um, and the embed system really started with the Iraq War, and I um, was against the Iraq War. I didn't think it was the right idea at the right moment. And, um, and But in 05, I was embedded, and you know, I grew up at, you know during Vietnam, and and I, you know, I had a very skeptical idea of the U.S. military, frankly. Um, and our military has changed tremendously since then. And um, and so my experience with those guys in 05 in Zabel, I, I was with a uh, battle company of the 173rd, just randomly. I was just put with those guys. And my experience with them was just incredible. I was blown away by those guys. And I just thought, okay, if, if they go back to Afghanistan... Not Iraq. I didn't want to. I did not want to go to Iraq. But if they go back to Afghanistan, maybe I'll follow one platoon for a whole year. And I couldn't spend a whole year with them. But um, I managed to do five one-month trips, uh, starting in June '07. And my colleague Tim Hetherington uh, also did five one-month trips. Sometimes with me, sometimes we were apart, uh, depending on our schedules and and who had you know been injured the worst recently. We kept getting injured out there, and. Um, so um, that was how the, the, the book came to be, and, and Restrepo, the movie, we both shot, Tim and I both shot, we carried video cameras all the time, uh, we both shot all of the footage um, in that movie, and we directed it, produced it, um, we did the whole thing from beginning to end, it was an incredible experience. If I could just follow up on one more thing about sort of the, the geography and sort of choreography of where you lived and where you were. Uh, and again, uh, I know many of you are familiar with either the book or the movie, but we're talking about eastern Afghanistan in uh, Kunar province in the Korangal Valley. Uh, and we'll come back later to the fact that the United States is no longer emphasizing some of these areas as much as we once thought we should, and I would like to get your thoughts on that. But before we get into those broader policy questions, uh, I was just curious about if you could describe for those who haven't yet you know, uh, gotten through uh, that part of the book or the movie, what it was like, just the physical setting, how many people lived in the, in the Korangal outpost where you spent, I think, much of your time, uh, just a little bit of a feel for the layout. Yeah, it was really rough out there. The Korangal is six miles long, very steep valley, um, at, starting at about 5,000 feet, going up to about 10,000 feet. Uh, big, big timber in the upper ridges, I mean, almost like redwoods, huge, huge uh, trees. Um, that were cut down and, and uh, exported uh, for timber. I mean, it was a real cash crop out there. Um, the the COP, the Korongal Outpost, was the company headquarters. It had a, an LZ uh, and um, uh, HESCOs, you know, fortifications and bunkers. Um, and it what it basically there was a lot of high ground around it, and so the enemy, uh, it was the, the 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 base was put in in. Um, uh, 2005, six, uh, 2006, and uh, it was in order to stop the Taliban from using the Korangal as a, a sort of um, launch pad to attack to launch to launch attacks on the Pesh River Valley. The Korangal itself really had no inherent importance. It was six miles, six miles long, dead end valley, but they were using it to attack the Pesh River Valley and elsewhere in Kunar, and those areas were important. So they put the cop in there. Um, it immediately just started getting hammered, and uh, but it did absorb a lot of the kinetic energy 
uh, in that area. And once the cop was in there, um, the attacks on the Pesh really dropped off, and the Americans were, were able to pave a road um, all, just about all the way in. They brought in schools and all, the, all that good stuff, that uh, hearts and minds stuff that is supposed to allow us to win wars like this. Um, but the result was that the Korangal really turned into a, a shooting gallery. And they, so the enemy would climb up these ridges and shoot down into the cop and very effectively. And so at, at one point, um, about two months into the deployment that I was following, uh, they dis, uh, three months, they, um, uh, Captain Kearney and the battalion commander decided to, to take over the high, that one piece of high ground, um, take it away from the enemy. And so they... they Two platoons walked up there in the middle of the night with with uh, tools and their weapons, and they started digging. and They dug all night. Uh, there was no sand up there for the sand to fill the sandbags. Um, they just hacked at the rock with pickaxes and put the rubble in the sandbags, and they piled them up. and When it got light, they got attacked, and they were attacked 13 times that in that first day. Um, they worked and fought. They just alternated working and fighting straight for 24 hours, and. In the end, they had this outpost, Restrepo, uh, named after the platoon medic who was killed early in the deployment, um, and uh, it was it was nothing. I mean, it was the size of this room, maybe. Um, it had no LZ. There was you had to walk there. You couldn't get in and out of there any other way. Um, there was there wasn't even a generator for electricity at first. Uh, they the guys slept on the ground. They didn't have structures. It was sandbags and crates of ammo and MREs and bottled water. There was no running water. There was no way to bathe. The guys just lived in their um, their combat fatigues, um, slept in them, patrolled in them, lived in them, so they literally fell off their body, you know, rotted and ripped and fell off their bodies. They were up there a month at a time. Uh, there was no um, internet. There was no phone. Uh, there was no television. There were no girls. There was no alcohol. There was nothing that young men liked. Um, except possibly combat, actually. And there was a lot of combat. Um, uh, there was, my first day up there, we were attacked four times. Um, the unit was in 400 firefights uh, during their deployment. Uh, a fifth of all the combat in all of Afghanistan was happening inside those, those six miles. 150 men of battle company were absorbing a fifth of the combat for 70,000 NATO troops uh, at times in, in, uh, in that area. So, um, you, you know, they were up there for a month at a time. They'd come back down to the cop once a month. They'd take a shower. They'd burn their clothes, get new clothes, call their girlfriend uh, or not call their girlfriend. And um, then they'd head back out. And they did a year like that. And that was where I spent almost all my time was out at OP Restrepo. They built little plywood bee huts that they could sleep in because uh, it got real cold in the winter. And I had a bunk in one of the bee huts with first squad. And... Um, you know, off and on, that was my home for a year. It was an amazing, amazing experience. And about how many people at that location typically? I vary, but usually around 20 people. But then, you know, they'd send a patrol out, and then it would get cut in half. And uh, um, and so, you know, there was some concern that the out outpost would be attacked while a patrol was out. Um, so you'd have, you know, a squad defending an outpost, and, uh, you know, that's not going to go very well. A chosen company... Uh, one valley, one or two valleys to the north, um, had some terrible, terrible fights. Uh, they had a position like Restrepo called Ranch House. Uh, the en enemy overran the wire, got inside the bunkers. They were shooting from inside American bunkers, shooting into other American bunkers inside the base. Um, they, they, the guys, um, they suffered 50% uh, wounded rate. And the lieutenant finally called in airstrikes on himself, and the A-10, A-10 pilots wouldn't do it. And, and he said, look, we're, we're going to die anyway. You might as well. And the A-10 pilots cut the base in half with gun runs and saved those guys. And, and something like that happened another uh, two more times to Chosen Company. Uh, they had a terrible patrol. They sent out 28 men, and it got ambushed, and they had 100% casualties on that patrol, um, killed and wounded. And then the Battle of Wanat, which you may have, you may have heard of. Um, so there was real concern at Restrepo that if the enemy mounted an attack uh, uh, on the outpost with 200 men, they would lose half of them and they would overrun it. Like we we would all be dead. And that was that was the fear. That was the thing that you know kept you waking up in a panic at night, thinking that it was happening. You know, you dream. You know, you'd have combat dreams where you would dream you were hearing gunfire, 
and you'd think, oh shit, this is it, and you'd wake up, and then it wouldn't be. But it, you know, it, it was a, it was a psychologically, it was a rough way to live. And I would just uh, remind folks, I'm sure, again, many of you follow the war well enough to remember yourselves that there were actually cases, not in this particular combat outpost, I don't believe, but there were subsequent cases where exactly that did happen in eastern Afghanistan in particular, and you wound up having eight or ten Americans or once Frenchmen killed by this concentrated ambush, uh, just you know, really not an ambush, just a concentrated you know, uh, infiltration of uh, insurgents into the area, and then just a massive attack on the... Uh, undermanned base, and it happened. I think primarily after you had left uh, in that part of the country, anyway. Yeah. But it was always possible, and you, yeah. you folks knew it. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Uh, I wanted to take a little bit of a prerogative to read a couple of words from the book, and don't worry, I don't over overestimate my own reading ability, and <laughs> I'm not going to uh, pretend that I can do justice to the prose. But uh, I, I want to give you a little bit of a flavor and just indicate sort of my maybe one of my favorite paragraphs. But before I do that. And just to give folks a little bit of a sense of how the book is structured, uh, there are three big chapters, and they're titled Fear, Killing, and Love. And, I, and I'll obviously let Sebastian explain more, and that's where my question is going to go, is to ultimately, in a minute, ask you to explain how you decided to structure the book that way. Uh, but before I do, I wanted to give you a little context for just how thoughtful he was in the research plan that would make a Woodrow Wilson grad or Professor Proud, because... For example, the chapter on love, I just want to read a couple of his citations and the kind of research that went into this. It was obviously first-hand observation of the war, but it was also reading articles like um, Group Competition, Reproductive Leveling, and the Evolution of Human Altruism in Science magazine, or um, PhD uh, dissertation on stress in Israel and what the Israelis went through as they formed their state under constant threat of attack or other regarding preferences in a non-human primate, common marmosa provision food altruistically, proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. Or finally, um, uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, National Center for Injury Prevention and Control, uh, Wiscar's Inquiry Mortality Reports, but also uh, following that, the coevolution of parochial alt altruism and war, again from Science Magazine, trying to understand what's at the heart of human emotion and how humans behave under stress and what bonds them together and also brings out uh, the violent impulses in people. But again, the book finished up with a big chapter on love. And I think, again, Sebastian can explain more about why he chose to write the book that way in a second, but I just want to read one passage, and this is from page 154. And this is the kind of beautiful writing that you find throughout the book, but again, this is a powerful way to, I think, synthesize and summarize a lot of what he was doing with the, uh, with the story, just from one r sort of random page. Um, and also, I guess the, the other thing I like about this passage, as I hope you'll appreciate in a second, is that there are some big policy questions that the book gets at but sort of with a light touch. I think, I think it's fair to say, because you say so yourself, that the, the book's goal is more to get people to think about war than it is to tell them whether or not they should be in favor of this or that strategy, this or that conflict, uh, and just to make people aware uh, at a time when so few of us are directly involved in the military of, of what really is the essence of this kind of combat. So let me quickly uh, read through this paragraph and then ask Sebastian to say more about you know, how he chose to do the book this way. Combat was a game that the United States had asked 2nd Platoon to become very good at, and once they had, the United States had put them on a hilltop without women, hot food, running water, communication with the outside world, or any kind of entertainment for over a year. Not that the men were complaining, but that sort of thing has consequences. Society can give its young men almost any job, and they'll figure out how to do it. I think I'm I'm sure you mean uh, men and women, but in this case, it is all men because we're in a very restrictive environment and a very uh, combat-intensive environment where even these days, uh, as you know, uh, for that kind of job, the soldiers are all still male. Uh, they'll suffer for it and die for it and watch their friends die for it, but in the end, it will get done. That only means that society should be careful about what it asks for. In a very crude sense, the job of young men is to undertake the work that their fathers are too old for, and the current generation of American fathers has decided that a certain six-mile-long six valley in Kunar province needs to be brought under military control. Nearly 50 American soldiers have died carrying out those orders. I'm not saying that's a lot or a little, 
but the cost does need to be acknowledged. Soldiers themselves are reluctant to evaluate the costs of war. For some reason, the closer you are to combat, the less inclined you are to question it. But someone must. That evolution, excuse me, that evaluation ongoing and unadulterated by politics may be the one thing that a country absolutely owes the soldiers who defend its borders. Uh, so, thank you for making combat and life in Afghanistan so vivid. Can I now sort of ask the broader question of how did you decide to do the book this way, structure the book this way, and get at these big questions? Well, I, I mean, the, the typical um, form for the book would have been a sort of linear narrative starting at the beginning of the, you know, the history of a deployment, you know, like uh, my year in the Korangal. And, but, the, but the problem with that was that um, the learning curve for these guys was, was quite steep. So in the beginning, um, the worst battles happened, the, the most tragedy happened, the most drama happened. And then winter came and there was no fighting at all. And then spring came and there really, it just sort of fizzled out. And that's a terrible narrative arc. And so what I, <laughs> so what I decided to do was track those events in a sort of linear fashion, uh, but organize that material thematically as well. So, and it sort of made sense. Um, I was trying to figure out the, the primary emotional experiences of combat. Like the emotional, what Tim and I came to call the emotional terrain of combat. Um, the, 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 the military understands that there's physical terrain, you know, maps, uh, mountains and rivers and all that, and human terrain, which is the society that they are uh, acting in and fighting a war in. Um, I feel that the military has forgotten that there's a third kind of terrain, which I thought of as emotional terrain. The, the state of mind of the soldiers, the emotional consequences of combat for the soldiers. That was what my book would be about. And I really thought very long and hard about it. Like, what is, what does combat feel like? What does that life out there feel like? And I boiled it down. It's pretty simple. There's fear, obvious, very obvious. There's killing, not something I was engaged in, but everyone else was, and they had some very conflicted feelings about it. Um, and love. And by that, I mean the incredibly strong bond within the group, within the platoon, uh, between the men, um, a bond that really um, transcended any most transcended most of their concern for their own lives. Um, it was very different from friendship. It was brotherhood, not friendship. I mean, there was friendships out there too, but friendship I came to think of really as a kind of civilian artifact. Um, that what you will do for a person depends on how you feel about him or her. Um, you won't sacrifice much for someone you don't like. And you'd sacrifice a great deal for someone that you like a lot. And that's not combat. That's not brotherhood. You can't have your, the, the, uh, your, um, your ability, your willingness to sacrifice, to endure hardships, or even <coughs> sacrifice your life for someone. You can't have that depend on your feelings for that person in, in, in a combat situation. Um, brotherhood is the understanding that you will put everyone else's welfare and safety above your own and that you really owe your life to the group and if everyone in the group does that everyone in the group collectively is safer and uh, that bonds um, which really was love I mean it, it, the willingness to die for another person I can't think of a more profound definition of love um, that was the thing that made them capable of overcoming their tremendous fear. I mean, everyone was terrified out there. I was, everyone was. Um, and their, their real discomfort at um, the idea, not continual, but occasional, but very extreme discomfort at the idea of killing. They, the, the guys overcame those two for psychological forces because of this bond, because of the concern they had for their brothers. And so... For me, um, that was, while tracking the, the events in the valley, that division seemed to get at the heart of what I was trying to understand. What does combat feel like? And ultimately, for something that's so damn awful, why do they miss it? Like, why do men come home from combat? And I keep saying men because it was all men out there. I apologize, but I just keep saying it because that's what was out there. Um, 
Why do men come back from combat, the worst experience of their lives, and miss it? Um, I really felt like I had to explain that. And I think the explanation is rooted in the material I covered in the last chapter of Love. I just have one more question before we open up to all of you. And uh, it's a policy question, but it's not a policy question about whether or not you favor the war. And you and I had discussed this earlier. I know you're willing to engage in yeah. that if anybody else wants to. But I really, sort of following on what you just discussed about what war does to people, for people, uh, and how it's both a terrible experience and yet such a memorable and powerful experience, and how it has elements of a, a positive character, even in the midst of such tragedy, raises the broad question about you know the military's relationship with broader society in the United States today, questions about whether we should have some form of mandatory national service, uh, and you can get to that question either because you think it's fundamentally unfair that we ask such a small percentage of the population to go up and do these terrible things, or because you think that there's something that's enriching about being asked to do something for your country. And, and when I say mandatory national service, uh, I think if you talk to most people in the military, they, they would hate the idea of a draft where anybody or everybody had to do military service. And we don't, we don't need four million people each year to join the military. We don't have a military of that size. Um, but, you know, in theory, one could have mandatory national service with military uh, participation as one option. But I was just curious how you think about the issue of whether we need to sort of shake up our society and find a way to have more people somehow engaged in this experience because of either the negative argument or the positive argument of what yeah. war means. And uh, I don't know if you have a comment on that question. I, it, yeah, I mean, it's complicated. The soldiers definitely did not want a draft. Um, and it was, very, it was interesting, I think, for several reasons. One of, one of the reasons is they, they all, not only did they cho choose to be out there, they wanted to be out there. And they may have regretted their decision, but they themselves set in motion um, the process that put them on that hilltop. And they all knew it, and it kept the grumbling to a minimum. I mean, they bitched about it, what it felt like, but they, didn't, they, ne they never felt sorry for themselves. Because, you, you know, they, were, they all joined the Army, and they didn't just join the Army. They joined the 173rd Airborne, and they actually had to go through some pretty extreme tests to get in. I mean, they made the first string of the football team, as far as they were, they were concerned. So they don't, you know, if they're, if, when you're asleep, you know, at a place like Restrepo, the only reason you can get any sleep at all is that you're pretty sure that the guy on guard duty is not sleeping, because he's, he wants to be a soldier, he wants to do this well, he doesn't want to let his brothers down, um, and you don't really want draftees on guard duty well at a place like Restrepo. I mean, that's how the soldiers thought of it. Um, I, but I also think they really did have a kind of refreshing idea about what they thought this country was about. And it's about personal choice and autonomy. And, um, I, you know, they, they, they're they very proud of their personal choice of joining the military. Um, and I think part of it is that they're very proud that that means other people don't have to. And it, it's, it's a weird kind of altruistic way of thinking, and they all kind of talk like that, like, look, we wanted to do this, but we don't want to live in a country where we're told to do things, you know? I mean, that was kind of the flavor of the conversation, and I think, um, I mean, it's, I think some of, I mean, am I really going to bring up the healthcare debate right now? I think, uh, I think some of the discomfort um, in sort of mandatory healthcare um, isn't so much does it work on paper with you know, does it, does it work financially for this country? I don't know if it does or doesn't. It doesn't. I have no idea. But it is this sort of, like, American discomfort at, wait a minute, you're going to tell me to do something? And I think it would be very hard. That's In, in some ways, that's tiny compared to telling someone to spend two years doing whatever it is, either serving the military or building trails in Yosemite, or God knows what it would be. Um, I, 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 think there, I, think, I think that's a hard idea to, to float, at least in this generation, uh, in America. And, and the guys, I don't know, they didn't, they didn't want that. Interesting. 
But why don't we please I'll open it up to you all and start right here. I guess we should ask people to please identify themselves. And are we passing around a microphone or just asking people to project? Uh, I would ask, uh, my name is Edward Do you want to bring him a microphone, or how should we do it? Great. Thank you. And I'll go to you next, sir. I would ask the group of 20, Was there was nobody rotated at 20. It was the same 20 for the full year. And No, no, it wasn't. I'm sorry if I was imprecise. The platoon was about 30, 35 guys. Um, they had to handle a couple of other smaller positions. So uh, it was 20 at any one time, but they would rotate out by squad and they'd spend like three days at the COP, and then they'd move to other more isolated positions, and then back to his group. And were they volunteering to go to their unit to go to the COP, or were they no. simply sent there? They didn't volunteer specifically to be there for a year in the most difficult combat and isolated situation. They did not volunteer for that, is that correct? Well, they didn't. They, Restrepo didn't exist when they when they were sent over there. They didn't. They had no idea what they were heading into. They knew that they were in the 173rd, and that whatever they did was probably going to be pretty hard. But no, they didn't know specifically that they would be out there at Restrepo. No. And lastly, was their operation successful? Did they take the pressure off of the shooting from both ridges down in the valley? Yeah. When they when they built Restrepo, I mean, interesting sort of just tactically speaking, if trying to solve the military problem in that valley. That one outpost kind of did it. I mean, it really tipped, it tipped the balance. It meant that there were very few places in the valley where the Taliban could maneuver on the company headquarters without being seen. Um, and so not, so, so not only did they take away the high ground from being used to attack the cop, it also meant they had greater visibility, and they killed, they killed guys, they killed Taliban all over that valley once they put in the strip over. Sir, that will. I've waited a long time to ask this question from somebody who can really evaluate the answer and who will tell us the truth. All right. Can you evaluate the surge for us, please, sir? Can I evaluate what? The surge in Afghanistan. The surge. Uh, I, I, you know, I was there before the surge, so I'm evaluating it from the perspective of reading the New York Times and watching the news and trying to put it in context of what I know. Um, and what I've heard, I mean, the surge was primarily in, in the south, in, in, in Helmand, around Kandahar, um, that it was pretty devastating for the Taliban. I mean, that's, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm believing what I was told, but what I was told uh, is that the, it put enormous pressure on mid-level Taliban field commanders. They killed a lot of them. They really, they really hit them pretty hard. Um, in some ways, it doesn't matter. In some ways, it matters a lot. The, the um, I think the real problem, I think the U.S. military uh, is probably the best military in the world and eventually will figure out any tactical problem. I think they will just figure it out. And I think over the course of 10 years, really five years of real combat. I mean, the war started in 01, but really the combat really started about around 2005. So... Um, I think they kind of figured it out, right? And they had enough man and then finally they had enough manpower and resources to implement what they figured out. So I they did do that. But here's the problem. They they are fighting the Taliban to protect the government of Afghanistan and the Afghan people. And they're gonna have to keep doing that. They can do that, they're succeeding at it. Um the Taliban are not gonna overrun Kabul, it's not gonna happen, okay? They're going to have to keep doing that until the Afghans can do it for themselves, and then we can leave, right? I mean, that's just to simplify things tremendously, that's the situation. But here's the problem. One, one Taliban fighter is worth about 10 Afghan National Army soldiers, 10 ANA. In, in effectiveness, in determination, in courage, in tactical ability. And it's literally like 1 to 10, right? And so I, 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 had, I was, had a conversation with the senator um, a few months ago about this, and I, you know, I said, you know, we're not gonna, we're not gonna be able to leave until we figure out why one Taliban fighter is worth about 10 ANA and fix that, and then we'll be able to go. And they're the same people, right? And es essentially the same people. So why the difference? And in his answer, and I think he's right. He said, well, the Taliban believe in what they're fighting for. The ANA don't. Well, why don't the ANA believe in what they're fighting for? 
They don't because they're fighting for, I mean, there are some wonderful, great, honest Afghan politicians, but on, on the whole, the Afghan government is completely self-serving and corrupt, and they know it. And so I said to the senator, would you risk your life or die for Hamid Karzai and, and, his, and his buddies? And, and, and the senator said, no, of course not. I was like, well, that's what you're really asking the Afghans to do so that we can go. And they're not going to do it because they're not stupid. And, and so really, you can have a surge. You can do anything you want militarily. And I think there has been great improvement militarily. But at the end of the day, if you don't twist the Hamid Karzai's arm to the point where it almost breaks on the issue of corruption and really force changes, at the end of the day, it will work as long as we're there. And as soon as we leave, it will fail because we are recreating the exact circumstances that got the Afghan people to allow the Taliban to come in in the first place with violence and corruption. And we're allowing that to recreate itself. Um, I, you know, it's just, it's, it, ultimately, the, the, the problem is a political problem, and it's one that the Bush administration did not face, and neither, neither is President Obama, and I think it's not going anywhere until we face it. Ma'am, um, next to our friend who just asked that question. I got the mic here, so... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, can, can I ask a quick one, then? Um, uh, my name is, uh, sorry, um, well, yeah, Peter Malik. Like so we can see it. Yeah, Peter Malik. Uh, question is, uh, what was the thinking of the American soldiers toward the Taliban? Was there respect, hatred? Was there, what, what was it? Uh, that's, that's a good question. Um, I mean, there was sort of a bit of everything, you know? Uh, I mean, fighters respect good fighters. They do, you know? The, 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 the Greeks respected the Trojans, you know? I mean, there is a certain kind of respect between people who are in that business for each other. And there were Taliban fighters out there who were good. They were brave. They did not mind dying. They did stuff that the Americans would be like, oh my God, I can't believe. You know, they're, 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 they're shooting at an Apache helicopter with an AK-47. Like, maybe it's stupid, but it's definitely brave. And so they, on, on one level, they had a lot of respect for them. On another level, they hated them. They hated them because they thought they didn't fight fair. They hated them because they couldn't see them. They never saw the enemy, almost never saw the enemy. Um, and they hated them because they thought they were real thugs and they beat up on the local population and they killed a 13-year-old, 15-year-old boy by cutting his throat along with his grandfather, a, a kid who worked at the, at, the, at the American base. You know, really, there were really poor people in that, in that valley and the base hired a lot of people and it was a good thing for those people uh, up until the point where the Taliban got their hands on them and cut their throats. And, and so there was a kind of mix of reasons that they really loathed them. But as fighters, um, they, the better ones, they were fighters that weren't very good too. And they, they, that was pretty clear. But the good ones, yeah, they respected them. Is that Wendy? Yeah, please. Yeah, Wendy Gerber. I've heard you speak before about the uh, community beatings that they had. And as incongruous as it might seem, it seems to epitomize the sense of brotherhood and love that you were talking about, and I'd appreciate it if you'd speak a bit about that. Yeah, the community beatings. <laughs> uh, well, well, here, I mean, oh, it sounds so awful when you say it, doesn't it? What, so what, what, basically, what they had this thing called blood in, blood out. And the way it worked was this. There, there were a certain set of very simple rules up at Restrepo. Primarily, as I said, that you are less that you are prepared to devote your 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 life to the group. I mean, just to put it in a simple sentence, um, and that's not how things work in society back home. And when the guys went on leave, eighteen day leave, they got one one eighteen day leave in your deploy fourteen month deployment. The guys kind of intuitively knew, like you're leaving this set of rules. And then you're going to go back to the other world where everything's reversed and everything's about you. Things are not about other people. And then you come back where we own you and, and because you're part of the platoon. And that's, that was sort of the, the understanding. They, the guys understood that that was a tricky passage psychologically to leave that hilltop and then come back. And so when you left, um, you got 
grabbed and held down and, and beaten in a kind of loving way. I mean, they didn't break any bones, and they didn't really draw too much blood, but it, it got your attention. Um, and They threatened to do it to me, but they never did. Um, and then when you came back, you got uh, blooded in again, and you're now part of the group. And, you know, I studied cultural anthropology. That was my major in college, and one of my, my term papers was on, uh, on male initiation rites. And I, I, I was just sort of amazed watching this. Um, first of all, had any of the guys that were being subjected to this, had they, had they said, stop it, the guys would have stopped it. And he would not have continued very long in that platoon. Like, they did not want cowards up there, and they did not want people who were not willing to sacrifice, to, to, to uh, commit some level of sacrifice for the group. And if you can't take a 10-minute beating for the guys to show that you're one of them, you're definitely not going to die for somebody and you're out of there. And so, it, you know, I feel like the sort of abuse slash hazing um, phenomenon that you know, popped up in American high schools a few years ago is very different because you can't say, hey guys, stop, and get them to stop. In this, it really was almost a kind of honor to be tested like this and to pass that test. Um, and they somehow instinctively recreated, out of necessity, out of a kind of psychological necessity, I think, they basically recreated the essence of initiation rites as they have existed in, Amer in, in human society and tribal society since the Stone Age, probably. And they didn't know that they'd done that, but that's what they'd done. It was a really, uh, it was a really amazing thing to watch. Yes, please. Yeah. No, I was wondering, if there was a... Go up here in the front row, please, and then... Um. There was a book years ago called They Came to Cordura, and it was about the Pershing campaign in Mexico and picking people for the Congressional Medal of Honor and then taking them back. And the essence of it was that a lot of, some of these people were psychopaths, some of them were suicidal, you know, some of them actually had a screw loose. I mean, I'm not trying to denigrate the people who were there, but there must have been a spectrum as the, you know, as you see in all of the war movies where, where some people literally are, are virtually trying to get themselves killed and others want to kill. Is there that spectrum in these in these troops or in general? Um, I I, did, I didn't see that. I mean, what what I did see. I mean, it's 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 it, it's really unprofessional to get yourself killed unnecessarily in combat. I mean, that would be a soldier's view of, like, you just ran out there and got yourself killed, and now we got to drag you back. Someone's going to get wounded trying to drag your body back behind cover, and then we're going to have to call it a medevac. And that's going to get shot at. And what were you thinking? Come on, man. Like, you're putting everyone at risk by doing something stupid, getting wounded, getting killed, not drinking enough water on a patrol and dehydrating, all of those things. Like, you do that, we get killed, that's wrong. And so, the guy, you know, recklessness, carelessness, um, the sort of cowboy, like, sort of cowboy attitude was, uh, I never saw it. And, and I think, had I seen it, it would have been crushed immediately by the commanders, and if they didn't see it, by the guys themselves. And um, as, as accurate and moving as the Hurt Locker was in many, many ways, the one thing that I think they did not get right was that aspect of um, the central ethos of the soldier is you do not endanger your, your brothers unnecessarily, and that guy was doing that, and he wouldn't have lasted very long. So. Um, but that said, they're one of the reactions to the incredible grief of losing people out there. Devastating grief. I mean, awful, awful things. Those. I mean, those guys, you know, you kind of learn about more human mortality as you get older in your 20s, in your 30s, in your 40s. Friends start to die. Parents start to die. These guys are learning, learning about mortality, about death, at 19. You shouldn't be learning about it at 19. And they are. And it was devastating to them, and so there were times, you know, when guys got killed, one of the reactions among certain of the soldiers was a really kind of like reckless, I'm just going to not worry about it, I'm going to get myself killed. Mm -hmm. And this one guy, Cortez, ta talked to me about that, and he finally stopped. He said he wouldn't take cover during firefights, he just was really almost kind of suicidal. And he said he stopped because someone pointed out like, 
look, man, you you know, you can get yourself killed if you want, but you're going to get someone else killed in the process because we're going to have to deal with it. We're going to have to we're going to have to get your body out of here and don't. And th when when it was phrased in terms of endangering his brothers, that got him to stop. He had huge emotional problems afterwards, but it did get him to stop that behavior. Yes, take the two gentlemen here. And, uh, one and a half. Hi, David Martin. I'd just like to turn it back a little personal to you. When you were out in Strepo, did you carry a weapon? And were you, I know you were a journalist, but were you prepared to fight and uh, to keep from being killed yourself? Um, I know I did not carry a weapon. Um, occasionally the guys would offer, um, I think more jokingly than anything else, but also they, they were into the weapons. And, and uh, you know, the idea of being in a place that miserable without the best thing about being there, without having a weapon, was to them was just completely crazy. Like, <laughs> and, uh, um, I, I think in the in my book, I think I said something a little risque. I sort of compare. I was like, it was like you know they thought of it sort of like going to a brothel and staying in the, and just staying in the lobby. Like like what are you what are you doing here then? Like what? So so no, I did not carry a weapon. There's a huge ethical line in journalism that you do not carry a weapon. Um, that said, you know like stories about chosen company started sort of dribbling, trickling trickling into the Korangal, you know, 100% casualty rates on ambushes. And, you know, when in that one instance, um, when the 28 got, you know, the 28-man 28, 28 patrol got hit, and the, every guy had a bullet in him inside three minutes, and the wounded fought off the enemy for the next three hours until air power got there. You know, you hear a story like that, and you really kind of think, like, as a, as a civilian, as a journalist in that environment, you really kind of think, I don't want to die like that, and I don't want to. I don't. I don't want to allow other people to die like that because I don't know what I'm doing. And so, uh, Tim and I uh, asked the the medic to instruct us in um, battlefield medicine, how to stop a, 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 a um, someone from bleeding out, uh, chest chest decompression for a lung wound, um, clear the air passageways. These are basic battlefield medicine. So that, and we were given medical packs so that we could attend to our own injuries or someone else's injuries if it was a really, really desperate situation. Um, and, and then came the weapons, and they were like, listen, we may need you out here. You're like, you know, one of you guys stays behind on a patrol, there's 10 men, 10 men at Restrepo, and, you, and we get attacked. We're going to need an 11th guy, and this is how this stuff works. And they just, we didn't shoot them, but they, we just, they just walked us through it. Machine guns are simple. I mean, really, it's like... You know, they're like chainsaws, lawnmowers or something. I mean, they're not that complicated. And, 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 you know, we learned all that stuff in, you know, in a day. And thank God, never had to use it. But it was definitely in our mind. And as a matter of survival, mine or someone else's, I would have crossed that ethical boundary in a heartbeat if it was really life or death, of course. Hi, uh, Chris Bauer, MPA 86. Um, I, I want to ask you about, um, you know, your focus has been the, the, the military aspect, the civilian side in Afghanistan. And as a lark, about a year ago, actually, I friended a young man in Kabul on Facebook. And he'd been emailing back and forth. And initially, he was very positive about the Americans. Most of his friends actually get their uh, jobs through USAID. But lately, he's been more pessimistic. And he went, for example, last month to a wedding about... A, a couple hundred miles away and coming back the trip twice took twice as long because they kept encountering American convoys and it was sort of a very scary event to be traveling and, and also the stories about all the corruption the Kabul Bank um, the, 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 the political leaders that you mentioned that they don't have trust in um, the fact that the northern Afghanis don't like the southern and he mentioned that, that business has stopped investing in Afghanistan He's, he says there's talk about a civil war starting again and um, so he's been much more pessimistic these last couple of months than when I first friended him about a year ago. Um, I, I don't, I, you know, I don't know him, obviously, but um, I would imagine his fear is based on the idea that uh, if we leave, all of those things will probably happen. Um, and obviously, the president has been setting sort of target target dates and. That's a whole political calculation on his part that I, you know, that's a whole other conversation. But, but um, I think the effect in Afghanistan is, you know, a very loud ticking clock. And they're not a year away from 
uh, being able to take care of their security. They're not three years away from that. And so I, I think for many Afghans, I mean, they hate having foreign troops there. I mean, we would hate having foreign troops here. Like, it's obvious. But there are also, many Afghans are also really terrified of, uh, of losing, losing them because they know it'll pro almost certainly go back into the Civil War of the 1990s, which was an absolute bloodbath. And they all know it. And so they're, they're really in a horrible situation where their two choices are either really unpleasant or unimaginably bad. And um, yeah, I think that's what he was talking about. Right here, please. Um, so I have two questions. Um, one, you've talked a bit about the relationship among the soldiers and, and perhaps their um, impressions of the Taliban. I'm interested in understanding how your relationship evolved with them and how they felt about just having you there yeah. um, and over the course of the time that you spent with them and, you, in, and how that evolved. The second question is if there's um, something that um, stands out in your mind that surprised you based on conceptions that you might have had when you um, started this journey and, um, and that still stays with you as something that just was surprising. Well, they, initially they were quite happy um, that they got word that two Vanity Fair reporters were coming out and they were pretty psyched about it until uh, we showed up and they realized that we were met. <laughs> that, was, that was when the problem started. Um, and, uh, and so, you know, I mean, if you, if you try to insert yourself in, in any close-knit group, I mean, just think about high school. I mean, any close-knit group, and particularly one that's essentially fighting for its life, um, they don't let people in easily, and there's no reason for them to. Because anyone in that group can get everyone killed if they do something really stupid, and they know it. And there's a kind of bond that develops in a group like that. You can't just walk in there and suddenly be, like, have everyone be thrilled you're there. And um, so, like... Like high school, like anything, it takes a while. And the first trip, they were kind of just informal, but they were polite enough. De definitely a little sullen, you know, in a kind of teenage way. I, I sort of felt like I was suddenly, you know, I was like a parent or something, and my like my twenty teenage sons were upset with me, you know, a little bit, a little bit of that flavor. And then um, the next trip, uh, there was so much combat, and Tim and I. You know, they, they, they realized that we could handle ourselves in combat, we could walk any control that they could walk, we'd sort of pass the physical test, and we started to get to know each other. And, you know, there was one hilarious moment. Uh, humor goes a long way, by the way, towards becoming accepted in a group. There was one hilarious moment where, you know, Tim was this, this very tall, gangly, handsome British guy, right? And some of those guys had never even met a British guy before. You know, most of them probably. And Tim had a a fanny pack that, um, you know, with his passport and stuff that he had underneath his clothing, and it, it, it was tied with a little red string around his waist. And so one of these guys saw this red string, and when Tim was in the latrine, which was completely see-through, by the way, and, and, um, and thought that Tim was uh, wearing a thong, a red thong. <laughs> and then, he's, then he thought, well, maybe that... British men just wear red thongs. Like, maybe this is a British thing. And then he, he kind of kept this terrible information to himself for a couple of days, and he finally, he just couldn't stand it, and he went to the lieutenant, and he told the lieutenant about Tim's thong. He said, sir, I think the, the English guy's wearing a thong. And so the lieutenant finally asked Tim. And when Tim realized, like, what was going on, he literally dropped to his knees. He was laughing so hard. That kind of thing, you know, you're like... That kind of thing happens a few times, and you start to be accepted. And then, at the opposite end of the spectrum, uh, Tim, um, on you know, we started alternating. I ruptured my Achilles tendon out there, and uh, really sort of limped and dragged myself through the next three weeks, and uh, very painful. And I was, you know, it was a problem. And I got home, and I had to rehabilitate it. So Tim took the next trip by himself, and he was on a long, week-long operation called Operation Rock Avalanche. Two guys got killed, four or five guys got wounded. It was a really bad week. And um, the last night, they were walking down off the Abascar from, from about 9,000 feet down to 5,000 feet. And 
Um, and Tim broke his leg at night. He was walking at night with a pack, and he broke his leg. And um, sorry, you just got to walk on it. And he walked on a broken leg the entire night so as not to endanger everyone else in the group. And they couldn't get a medevac in, and they, they sure as hell couldn't carry him. And so he just gritted his teeth and did it. And, um, you know, once you've done something like that, the guys really don't have anything to worry about or to complain about. And after, and then I got blown up. And I mean, that was a Humvee that was blown up. And, you know, we just kept coming back. And no matter what happened, and at that point, they, you know, the guys are like, okay, you're, you're one of us. I mean, they literally said that in, in those words. Um, several of them said that explicitly. You're, you're, you're one of us now. Like, that's, that's how we feel about you guys. Extraordinary. Uh, I'll go to the back row, please. Sorry, thank you. Uh, Joe Ficini. In your book, you mentioned a lot of the uh, troubled lives the uh, men came from before they enlisted. And then you also mentioned the baggage they took with them from the war, um, the psychological addictions to combat or, or what have you. Um, do you think, from a purely selfish standpoint, from their shoes, was, was it a good thing that they enlisted or was it a mistake? How was it for them? Uh, you know, I, think it I don't think you can generalize. I mean, it's like, is going to med school a good thing or a mistake? I mean, I, you know, like, it's exactly what some of them needed. And it, and it probably destroyed some others. And it, some of the guys who got destroyed by it were probably headed down that route anyway, you know. And and the the their experience out there either delayed that process or hastened it. Um, there were guys who were they were they were fine, but they just were they hadn't grown up. They weren't disciplined. They didn't know how to focus. You know, this one guy, Kim, said to me, or was it Tobes? Tobes. He said uh, he said, look, I was just par I was just living at my mom's home and partying. I was going nowhere, and now, like now, uh, now I'm a man. I mean, they use that term, like now I'm a man, and he's going to get out of the army, and he's he'll be when he gets out, he's going to be a man in his mind, and I'm sure that will serve him well. Um, so I, I don't I don't think you can generalize, and I think the trick is to figure out for each individual person that they have to figure out is will this experience save me, and it does save some of them, or is it going to destroy me? And I don't know how you make that evaluation at 17 or 18, um, but I don't, I don't think you can sort of paint it with a broad brush. Let's do uh, two more questions. We've got one here, and then actually we'll do, we'll, we'll do um, three more, if you don't mind, because we'll go one here, and then uh, here in the second row, and then uh, we'll finish up back there. That's all right. Uh, thank you, um, Robert Johnston. Um, I'm old enough to have come of age during the Vietnam War, so I will say I wasn't there. Uh, but I felt then, and in retrospect, that we talked all the time about the Viet Cong, that you had some sense of who they were, what was behind them, the institutions that supported them, what, what made the whole operation tick, and what, what the aspirations were. And at least as far as I can read, mainly the American press or the, the academic studies and so on, I don't get any sense of who, quote unquote, the Taliban are. Uh, there, there has to be more to it than a bunch of guys running around with guns shooting people. But I don't see a sense of organization, aspiration coming out. And you must have some feel for the enemy, as you say. Yeah. What's there, what's behind them, what makes them tick, and what the broader picture is somewhere. Well, I mean, the term Taliban is really a sort of broad term that encompasses a lot of different groups. Originally, the Taliban, a Talib, Talibs are students, and originally the Taliban were Afghan refugees in Pakistan who were trained in the madrasas, um, in madrasas that were usually uh, funded with Saudi money, and, and with the Saudi money came uh, uh, a Wahhabi interpretation of Islam, which is extremely... Um, extremely rigorous and fundamental, and um, uh, and so they so there was a whole generation of Afghan children, boys who were trained at the, these madrasas, and that they were sort of organized and used by Pakistan 
um, as a proxy force in Afghanistan. And, and they were Afghan, but they'd really come out of Pakistan and were directed by Pakistan. And these guys showed up in Kandahar and uh, over the course of a couple of years eventually took Kabul. And the Afghans, who knew it was a... I mean, many of them knew it really was a takeover by Pakistan. Um, they let it happen because they were... It was better than what was going on at the time. It was better than the warlordism and the violence and the civil war that they'd suffered for years. That was the original term, the Taliban. They were extremely organized, extremely directed. They had a very, very clear political agenda. Um, now it means, essentially, that people were fighting. And it includes, um, it includes guys who were trained in the madrasas. It includes you know, 16-year-old Afghan boys who were paid $5 to carry an AK and shoot off a magazine, you know, go up on a hilltop and shoot off a magazine in American patrol. Uh, in the Korangal, it included these timber cutters that were out of work because, I mean, it's sort of complicated, but the Karzai government had banned timber cutting and timber export to Pakistan, and so that, there was a whole kind of timber insurrection in the Korangal. I mean, it's very complicated, but anyway, some of those guys traded chainsaws for, for machine guns, basically. Um, and then there are, you know, real, really sort of professional outfits like Gulbuddin Hekmatyar's fighters, the Haqqani network. Um, we call them all the Taliban. They're really many different things. They have totally different levels of fighting ability, totally different agendas. Some really have a global sort of anti-Western agenda. Some are illiterate farm kids in Afghanistan who are paid five bucks to shoot an AK. Um, or do they have a sort of political direction? Yeah, at the very top they do, for sure. The lieutenant colonel was about the best Princeton tie I ever saw. I think for two reasons you get that. I got it at the used store. Okay, <laughs> um, lieutenant Colonel John Stark, I run the ROTC at Princeton. I also am a lecturer in the history department, and I'm getting ready to go to Afghanistan as a rule of law field force team chief. Uh, the three of us over here, between us, we got four or five Iraq tours, no Afghan tours. Uh, first, I want to thank the crowd for turning out in such great numbers to support a topic about the military. It speaks volumes to Princeton's commitment to uh, staying in touch with, with what's going on in the, in the U.S. military. Not all the Ivy League schools have done that, and they're trying to do it now. The story missing in the, in the uh, New York Times right now is that Princeton has always had ROTC and it never stopped and has supported the military. But for you, Sebastian, um, thanks for what you've done. I came here mostly because I am the, the voice for the U.S. military at Princeton. I'm the one-stop shop here. There's about 10 of us connected. But uh, I also commanded a uh, team of observer controllers that trained OMLTs for uh, Afghanistan. About half of them were 173rd veterans, and most of them were chosen company from the previous deployment before, before you were out there. Uh, Dirk Ringenberg was the company commander. He was a Silver Star winner in 2005. And what we saw in Restrepo, it really was embarrassing to the U.S. Army because some of what you guys chose to show, and I, I don't think for a minute now after hearing you talk, that you chose to show something to embarrass the U.S. military. But there's guys out there in their, in their boxer shorts yeah. in a firefight. My specific question to you uh, is to ask, did, was that the way that it really was every time, or did you guys pick out uh, specific firefights where there were people without their shirts on? I mean, I'm, I came from Iraq, fighting in an urban environment yeah. in Ramadi. Nobody ever took their shirt off. Nobody ever was fighting in their in their underwear. Uh, were you trying to show the most um, outrageous things that were happening, or was there something there that you were trying to show? Because I'm telling you, the senior military uh, officers, they're really embarrassed by what they saw and where our talking points are to tell you this was a non-disciplined unit, this is not representative of the U.S. military, but you know as well as I do the 173rd is very well respected yeah. in the U.S. military and that's not what we would expect to see. And But yeah. what I saw in the movie and what I've read, what you showed had to be realistic because you were there, so it wasn't yeah. like it didn't happen. No, can, can you answer yeah. that? Uh, <laughs> uh, we, I mean, as, as journalists, what, you can't show everything. You're always making choices. Uh, so in some ways, the best you can do is 
try to be representative of all realities. And, you know, there are plenty of firefights that we show where the guys are dressed up exactly like you'd see out of a, you know, whatever, out of a catalog of, for soldiers or something, right? And, and then there's other, other firefights where, you know, it's extreme, it was extremely hot in the summer, and there were stretches where, you know, a week might even go by without a firefight, a couple weeks might even go by, and it was boring, and the guys would lounge around in their, in their, in their uh, gym shorts and, and flip-flops, and when you got attacked, you had to jump. I mean, you know, it was, they would attack with a lot of force, sometimes very, very up close, like right up into the wire, and you just jumped and grabbed your gun, and, and you know, eventually between bursts, you might put on your, your, your vest, your IBA, your vest and helmet. And so what you're seeing in that footage is the men reacting um, instantaneously to very sudden attacks, um, and yeah, it did get pretty funky out there. And, and that, as the year went on, there definitely was, um, it definitely looked weirder and weirder. And so it's partly the suddenness of the attacks, and they were just being practical about it. Like, why get killed in your uniform if you can survive in your boxer shorts, basically. Um, and it was partly, you know, morale, I don't, I don't, I don't think it, I don't think it dropped, but it changed. And in the last few months, there was a little bit of like, hey, man, we're almost through. We've earned, we're, we're, we're excellent. We're, we're some of the very, very best soldiers in the entire U.S. military. And, if, you know, if we're, if we're not completely regulation with our, with our pants, our pants bloused into our boots and, you know, whatever, like, the, the world's just going to have to deal with that. And, but to the point of the, the question of discipline, they were incredibly disciplined um, in the things that they felt mattered and that the lieutenant felt mattered. Um, but they definitely were not, they were disciplined, they are amazing soldiers, um, but they were definitely not regulation soldiers. And I guess ultimately there's a profound difference between those two things. But we know we were certainly not trying to embarrass anybody, but we did want people to know what it looks like out there. That's what it looks like. There are two of you sitting next to each other, and if you just package your question together, maybe I can ask you to... I think they're very we'll, different we'll, we'll let questions. Let Sebastian finish up on one, one, one final response. Uh, I think they're pretty different questions, That's but we can enough. make it two-part. Um, okay. <laughs> I wanted to hark back to what you said about your decision specifically not to carry a weapon. And um, I come from a photography background, so kind of as that, I've always assumed that that decision made by journalists and photojournalists it's very specific to sort of not be seen as the enemy um, and to not be seen, you know, to have more of a, an unbiased perspective on what you're covering. Um, obviously, you have some perspective. But um, I wondered, there always sort of seems to have been an understanding with journalists and photojournalists within crowds or in fighting situations that even if you're embedded in soldier, with soldiers, um, there's sort of in a, a less degree of danger to a sense, maybe because you're not fighting somebody. Obviously, if you're embedded, that's not the case. But um, I was wondering if you kind of speak, because I think recently that's not been the situation in a lot of the uprisings that we've seen. You know, there were so many journalists who were attacked in Cairo. Um, they started from reporting in the square, and by the end were, you know, up in hotel rooms looking yeah. down on it. Um, and how, how that's changed, and if you continue that, if you think that that will continue, the journalists will more and more be seen as targets, um, or if you think that's kind of more of an isolated incident by the nature of what's been happening. Do you want to take that separately? Or you want to... uh, and then... Oh, oh. <laughs> I, let me answer that, yeah, because otherwise yeah. I'm going to forget I, I, what you I thought, said. I thought you might want to, yeah. Uh, so, Sorry. I mean, the not, not carrying the weapon, uh, uh, you're, you're a journalist, so you're not, you don't you don't want to become the story you're reporting on. I mean, it turns into an Escher drawing, you know? Like, you, seriously, like, you're, you're, you're supposed to be, um, you're not supposed to affect the outcome a, in a meaningful way. And I, so that doesn't mean if someone's wounded, you can't help them. But I mean, you know, carry a weapon and start shooting it during firefights and then report on the war? I'm sorry. Like, that's the two different jobs. And it's not, it's not needed. Um, it's not because you're safer, like somehow the enemy won't target you. You're all the enemy. Like, you know, modern warfare, I mean, they're shooting bursts of a machine gun fire at distance of three or 400 meters at, at, at American positions. Like, 
bullets just hit whatever they hit. Like they're not, they don't care that the guy in the civilian civilian khakis instead of the like army issue camouflage has a video camera and not an not a not a machine gun. Like they just don't care. It's it doesn't. It's not a relevant detail to them. Um, and as far as you know, the situation in Cairo goes. Um, I mean, there's two kinds of danger. There's danger from the people you're with and danger from the people who are shooting at the people you're with. Like, those are two kinds of danger. And, um, you know, in Libya, um, my friend Tim, who lost his life a month ago, a month ago today, um, he, you know, the guys that he was with, the rebel fighters he was with, um, they, I mean, they, you know, they were fine. Like, they, he wasn't in danger from them. He was in danger because Gaddafi, Gaddafi's forces dropped a mortar on their heads. And uh, possibly because they knew they were journalists. It was a group of five, five journalists. Um, so there are wars where you have to, or situations where you are probably more in danger from the people you're with, and those are the most terrifying. And that was Liberia. That was Sierra Leone. Um, I guess that was Tahrir Square for a while. Um, that's that's absolutely terrifying because there's no safe there's no safe place. You don't know who to trust. You're totally powerless. And you know, compared to compared to that, Restrepo was a piece of cake psychologically. I was with guys that I trusted from day one and grew to love. And so, all you had to worry about was the bullets, and they weren't really very good shots. The Taliban. So. And then, yeah, part two. That's an amazing answer, yeah. Thank you. Please. Part final, two is very question. different, sorry. <laughs> okay. More of a policy, policy question. All right. It was just wondering, having seen firsthand the psychological effects upon the soldiers, what do you think the U.S. government should be doing to better integrate soldiers as they come back from Iraq and from Afghanistan? You know, I didn't... I, I, I don't know a lot about it. Most of the guys didn't come back. They stayed in the Army. They stayed in the military. They continued doing deployments. A few trickled out. I watched them kind of crash and burn. Um, they were all guys who went into the army with a lot of personal problems, a lot of psychological problems. So I don't, you know, it's really hard for me to sort of evaluate cause and effect here. I think the 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 VA really failed those guys. I know Brendan O'Byrne, the sort of main character in my book. Um, I watched his struggles with the VA and. You know, it's just a god awful bureaucracy and very slow. And um, so, you know, what can the government do better? I mean, I think they can make more efficient the bureaucracy that runs this thing. And um, they, I mean, they, you know, Brendan did have access to, to psychological counseling and to medication and stuff like that, but everything took three months, you know? And so sometimes these guys don't have three months. I mean, psychologically, they don't have three months. They have a weekend to get help. They have they have a week before they start drowning psychologically. And so, I, I think it's I think they're trying to figure it out. But I, there's there's a sluggishness to the process that is, um, you know, will probably kill people. Well, I want to uh, thank you so much for coming tonight to talk about your work, and you. uh, also thank you, Michael, for for. Uh, engaging uh, Sebastian in this really interesting conversation. So, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.